Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Lecture 36 and we continue our discussion on properties of filters uh, with the help of 1D convection equation. We pick up uh, a basically unstable Euler CD2 scheme and uh, we design a transfer function in such a way that we can modify the numerical amplification factor g with the help of this and solve this problem in a perfectly neutrally stable manner. <coughs> However, in doing all this, we have already uh, seen that uh, basically most of the discrete uh, computational methods introduce Fourier substream propagating waves and uh, this is the uh, extreme form of a dispersion error and as we have talked about uh, filters uh, can alter the dissipation and dispersion properties. So, we need to relook at Q waves in the context of filters, but before we do that, we take a look at the G contours with and without filter and we pick up some examples of uh, rotary oscillation of a cylinder in a uniform flow and we find out that uh, if we uh, perform a filtering in uh, a particular direction, then this vertical structures actually uh, elongate stretches in that particular direction and of course, uh, filter does uh, attenuate the solution. So, we cannot avoid that. This can be somewhat uh, uh, mitigated by reducing uh, the frequency, uh, increasing the frequency of filtering uh, as well as considering the directionality of the filters in terms of azimuthal versus uh, radial filter for this rotary oscillation problem. And we notice uh, that uh, azimuthal filters applied globally gives rise to serious issue. Now, uh, in the following, we discuss about a new class of uh, filters that we have designed, uh, where the filters are themselves um, upwinded in the interior. Once again, this is done using Pardes schemes and we uh, work out the transfer function real and imaginary part and identify what is the alteration of the dispersion properties. And please note that. Uh, in this particular uh, effort, we are trying to alter the dispersion properties in such a way that we can remove Q waves. So, the motivation for this upwind filter design is uh, to remove Q waves by a clever design of the filter itself. <coughs> we also note uh, that uh, filters can be very uh, interestingly used uh, for large eddy simulation or detached eddy simulation used in fluid dynamics, uh, because essentially filters does band limit the solution and that is exactly what is done in LES, but LES is far too complicated a process where you actually uh, filter the governing equation and that brings in newer stress terms which have to be modeled. So, that could be completely uh, removed by the present approach of using uh, this implicit filters as a post processing operation. This should conclude our discussion on filters and we can then begin our discussion on introduction to finite element methods, which is uh, basically identifying the nature of global versus local method and what are weighted residual methods. That is what we will briefly introduce and we will conclude this lecture. I would still uh, discuss a little more about filters because uh, that is related to one of your assignment and I think this is one of the most beautiful tool that has emerged over last uh, 15 years to do many things which were otherwise thought impossible. So, let us say if you are uh, trying to uh, solve a problem, an example, a convection dominated flow and you take this model equation once again. and we know it is a property that it does not disperse, it does not attenuate. 
and uh, you apply an algorithm, let's say, which we know is uh, problematic, namely the central scheme uh, in space and forward in time. And uh, going through this uh, motion uh, of defining functions with respect to the uh, Fourier Laplace transform, we define uh, the numerical amplification factor uh, taken with the help of uh, the CFL number. This is the algorithm that you actually use. And uh, when you actually uh, use uh, the spectral representation of A in uh, D, uh, you get this. And this is what we uh, have noted that uh, it is an unstable scheme. So, what do you do? Uh, people have uh, probably earlier thought that it is a no win situation, but uh, we will see today itself that uh, by applying additional explicit filter, we can uh, work out uh, uh, a stable al algorithm and uh, maybe even a neutrally stable algorithm. That is uh, one of the idea. <clears throat> so, basically, if you have a, a solution obtained at an advanced time level, uh, you want to filter it uh, indicated by this capped quantity, then uh, we will uh, define the amplification factor at the end of uh, numerical integration and filtering is given by what you obtain after filtering uh, divided by the solution that you had uh, before uh, time integration. right? So, this uh, we split it into two parts and uh, you can notice that uh, we have artificially introduced this factor u of uh, k h at uh, t n plus 1. So, this is basically the output of your numerical integration. Um, that is what we have called as the transfer function of the filter. right? So, this is what the filter does. It takes uh, this denominator and produces the numerator. So, that is the transfer function. <coughs> and then this is the basic numerical method by which you have uh, reached uh, T n plus 1 from T n. Okay? So, this is uh, the usual uh, language with which we speak when we talk about explicit filters. We need to look at uh, T j of k. So, uh, show you a result which is uh, somewhat different than what you are going to do uh, in your assignment. Your assignment talks about propagation of a packet, but here we have uh, looked at even a simpler problem taken a domain and we say that uh, we have a periodic problem. So, the periodic problem is something like this you know a sinusoidal wave uh, propagating uh, entering through the left and exiting through the right. So, that uh, you can use the same uh, algorithm uh, C d 2 Euler and we know it is going to be unstable, but what we do is we apply a second order periodic filter and for this combination of k h equal to 0.2 pi, if you choose delta t in such a way that n c is 0.1 for this value of c equal to 0.1, uh, this uh, choice of filter coefficient of 0.48 would uh, make your method neutrally stable. So, that if I identify uh, one uh, period of the wave uh, by this solid red line here, that uh, after sufficient number of steps, uh, when you reach at t equal to 30, it is uh, uh, identified here at the exit plane and you see there is absolutely no attenuation here. So, this uh, should give you heart uh, in thinking that uh, filter is a technique by which you can uh, take an unstable method and make it work. So, this is one example that you are seeing here. Now, uh, there is something that uh, we already have seen. and. Uh, that is about uh, this uh, dashed uh, region here in this figure and in this figure where we are showing the group velocity uh, normalized contour for this type of combination. So, this is a, a four stage runge kutta method uh, used with that compact scheme that we have talked about and this is the C D 2 scheme with R K 4 and uh, as you see that uh, replacing Euler by R K 4 gives you a neutrally stable region which is shown by this uh, horizontally hatched uh, region, uh, but you can see that region exists over a very small value of k h. Uh, if you go little on this side, 
what will happen is you will get a damped region, right? So, that may not add to accuracy of the solution, that is what we talked about. Now, uh, when it comes to this uh, spurious uh, upstream propagating waves, which we have called the Q waves, uh, the situation is worse when you look at uh, PD2 scheme as compared to the compact scheme. And this is what uh, we have uh, uh, seen earlier, some animations also, what uh, this entails. <coughs> Today, we basically are going to talk about that uh, uh, what uh, filter can do to alleviate uh, similar such problem. Okay? So, if I uh, look at uh, OECS 3 RK4 scheme, uh, on the right hand side you can see that uh, the G contours are shown here in the K H N C plane and you see only this uh, region to the extreme left, uh, where you have neutral stability. right? Now, suppose I apply a sixth order filter uh, with a value of alpha as 0.45, then this G contours actually change like this. What is interesting for us to notice that of course, uh, this neutral region degrades. You get a neutral region now, which is uh, sandwiched here only. Okay? Whereas, uh, this 0.99 line that you, you could see here, uh, actually terminates up to here. And what is important for uh, us to realize that for this higher value of kh, the filter actually attenuates uh, it significantly. The filter effect that you would see mostly on this uh, high kh range, even when your n c is small. Here we had a neutrally stable region, right? Uh, this path, but here it is all gone. The g has become close to zero, right? So this is something we uh, have to realize why filter is a sort of a welcome so often, because most of the numerical problem originates uh, from high wave number region and if there are problems, uh, application of filter actually removes it uh, quite drastically. Uh, however, you may lose accuracy of the solution, that is another issue that we have to keep in mind. <coughs> now, show you an example of a problem, this appears uh, very simple. What you have is basically a cylinder and this cylinder is performing some kind of oscillation. It is going back and forth. So, that is what we call by rotary oscillation. It is not just simple rotation. It is doing a rotary oscillation. So, what happens half the cycle part of the flow on one surface will be, prop, will be opposing the convection direction. So, suppose let us say the flow is going from left to right here, then when it is uh, going uh, anti-clockwise, then the top surface you will have a opposing motion and that opposing motion actually enhances the chance of flow separation. And in another half of the cycle, you will see a similar thing happening on the lower surface. And when you keep doing this, this uh, cylinder keeps uh, performing this rotary oscillation, you will see a very uh, neat uh, train of vortices come out and these vortices are much, much stronger than what you are probably uh, told uh, if you have taken a course on fluid mechanics, if you keep a stationary cylinder. So, these are extremely uh, uh, strong vortices and uh, capturing this flow is not so easy. I uh, will not go about uh, CFD of that part, but what I am trying to show you here is basically look at this uh, top figure, where we have shown the lift coefficient, the upward force that the cylinder experiences as a function of time. And uh, if you look at uh, the three curves that uh, those have been shown here, the solid line is the one that uh, is uh, obtained without using any filter. And it seems to go on, go on, then at t equal to 47, it actually blows up. So, you see uh, what happens is sometimes you have to really uh, enlarge your window of observa observation to make sure that things are all right. Suppose, I would have stopped at 40 and say, oh, I could get a good solution and I could present such results. But here it is clearly seen that uh, at t equal to 47, all of a sudden the C L nose dives and the solution blows up. Why it does so? That is given in this uh, vorticity contour plot. What happens is, uh, this is uh, one of the vortex that has been shared in recent times. But prior to that, there was another vortex that was shared from the lower side, which goes and convects downstream. And uh, there are certain 
uh, parameters of this problem is the amplitude of oscillation and the frequency of oscillation. Those are given by those A and F F. So, please do not uh, uh, bother too much about exactly about those parameters, but let me tell you this flow is at a very low Reynolds number. It is as low as 150 and computing it is uh, one of the toughest challenge that we have ourselves encountered. So, it just simply blows up right. Now, <clears throat> what uh, we could do is we could then try to use filter and see what happens and this is what has happened here. We have applied a fourth order filter with a uh, alpha value very close to 0.4 uh, that is what is given here with this uh, square symbol here. Uh, no, no, the, the one sorry with this uh, dashed line with this uh, solid symbol here uh, that is a fourth order filter and uh, it goes to uh, uh, the value of alpha is 0 0.495. And what happens if you do that? The solution goes little farther than again that also blows up. So, this is uh, something uh, uh, that we should keep in mind that in a actual flow computations. It is not like 1D wave equation that you are solving uh, in your assignment. Everything is known, you can work it out. For a real problem, you would not know a priori what is the order, what is the filter coefficient that you have to choose. So, here a choice of a fourth order filter with the alpha equal to 0 0.495 uh, does not suffice. Why? That you can see here the vortex which was causing that solution breakdown, this vortex keeps on growing unphysically. Uh, continues to happen so. So, here is a case actually I think it is a sixth order filter, yeah it is a sixth order filter. Uh, the filtering direction, this is another uh, issue that I would like to bring to your attention. It is a two dimensional flow problem, right. So, we have a radial direction and we have azimuthal direction and the filters that we have talked about they are all one dimensional filter. So, what we could do is we could of course, apply it in the azimuthal direction then we could also apply it in the radial direction. What happens is the here you are seeing some results of azimuthal filters, but a six order filter with a value of 0.495 for alpha uh, does not suffice. At the same time, uh, if you apply a second order filter uh, and take the same value of alpha 0.495, uh, what you notice uh, that you can uh, co compute indefinitely. Okay. How good is the result? Now, that is a uh, very, very uh, valid question because the offending vortex which is causing the numerical breakdown here in these two cases uh, attenuates to this. This is a much more weaker vortex, but it also has a very uh, funny attribute to the solution. The vortex has been stretched in the theta direction because that is the direction along which we are doing filtering. So, if I keep uh, doing azimuthal filter, I may get around the instability problem, but then the vertical structures would take some unphysical attribute like here you can see this vortex has been detached already and this vortex has also been stretched in the theta direction. So, these are some of the issues that uh, one needs to worry about and uh, the another thing that uh, happens is uh, there is no need for you to do the filtering at every time step. Hmm? So, you can do it infrequently. So, that this frequency of filtering itself is another uh, parameter at your disposal that you could uh, make use of. So, what is uh, being seen here is uh, the solution that uh, we are showing for another case. This is a milder case. So, here we could uh, compute without any problem. You see the amplitude has uh, been reduced from 5 to 2 and the frequency has also changed to 4 and the unfiltered solution is shown here. Now, if you start applying uh, the filter, uh, in this frame you are seeing that a second order filter with the alpha equal to 0.4 has been applied and the interval of application of filter is about every 1000 steps you are doing it. Now, what happens? Uh, what happens is that if I do uh, infrequent filtering, then the basic numerical method has an amplification factor which is given by the first factor on the right hand side g j. And if I would have done it at every step, I would have multiplied by t j. But since I am doing 
after n time step. So, the resultant resultant amplification factor would be g j of the original method times the transfer function raised to the power 1 over n. So, you could actually reduce the intensity of filtering by doing infrequent filtering right. That is what is being suggested here and you could apply this procedure for uh, any order filter in any direction and that is what is uh, shown in this last three frames. Suppose, uh, I try to solve the problem using a second order filter and take the value of alpha same as 0.4 and if I keep doing uh, the filtering at every time level, this is the solution that uh, you get and I told you that if you do a azimuthal filter, you see this uh, unphysical attribute, the vortices are stretched in the theta direction and that is what you are getting. So, you are getting a so called stable solution, but not necessarily a, a good correct solution. If you uh, keep uh, filtering every uh, 10 steps, that is uh, this frame that you are seeing here, well you can see little more features coming out. Those unphysical stretching uh, in the theta direction has been prevented somewhat, but it is still not completely gone, because you see those vortices which are all there, they are all absent in these two cases. So, filtering actually removes uh, signal also. So, you have to keep uh, that in mind and then of course, uh, when you uh, increase the filtering frequency uh, further, you do it every 100 steps, well you start recovering back some of those lost uh, signals, but it still uh, you see there is this missing uh, structures. Whereas, if you increase it, uh, increase the frequency 10 times, uh, that is you are filtering every 1000 time step, well you can see more or less the structures uh, are there, but they are much more weaker because of the factor that we are applying a filter. Please do understand that uh, alpha equal to 0.4 is a quite a strong filter, it is not a very small uh, uh, quantum of filtering that one uses. <coughs> now, uh, having talked about the frequency of filtering, here is some results uh, where we are talking about the direction of filtering. Uh, once again on top, you have the unfiltered solution for the case just now we have seen uh, at a different time we are looking at and now instead of applying a second order filter uh, with alpha equal to 0.4, which actually uh, makes the solution totally unphysical here, we uh, decide to uh, take a higher order filter, a sixth order filter and also take alpha larger at 0.495. And uh, what we need to look at is uh, uh, what we get uh, if we do a filtering uh, in different direction. For example, this one here, we have used a azimuthal filter. So, basically the filtering is done only in the theta direction and you can uh, see there is uh, some effect, some effect of the solutions. Uh, there is a, a wrong speed of propagation of this uh, vertical structure. The strength also changes, the speed of convection of the vertical structures changes. Uh, however, near field structure uh, are modified less, but they are uh, indeed modified, but somewhat less. Okay? Now, if you uh, switch over from a azimuthal filter to a radial filter, and you start from the cylinder surface all the way in the full domain in the free stream, then you get a solution which actually looks like uh, what you have in the unfiltered solution. So, basically it tells you that uh, you have to understand the physics of the problem, because what happens? The flow is coming from uh, left to right and then a boundary layer kind of forms and that is separated by this uh, rotary oscillation. However, if you now apply a filter in the theta direction, it kind of performs a mixing operation in the theta direction, right? And that mixing, numerical mixing, actually prevents uh, separation, and that's what you have seen here. Uh, that uh, we would not have to worry about uh, sep uh, numerical separation at all. The results are wrong. That's a different issue. Whereas uh, so, this basically uh, counteracts 
the action of rotary oscillation in the flow. Here, the physical mechanism of the flow is determined by this rotary oscillation. And if I now filter in the theta direction, I am actually trying to take out the effect of rotary oscillation. Whereas, if you do a radial filter, you see that uh, that action of rotary oscillation is not interfered that much. And that is why you can see that uh, uh, you get fairly a decent result. Okay? And uh, of course, you notice that this filtering operation itself is done over the whole domain. So, you take all the points together and then you do a filtering. So, it does matter uh, at times that whether you are doing the filtering from the cylinder to the free stream that is going from the surface to outwards or from outside to the cylinder. Okay? And uh, you can see there would be some uh, differences and why would that uh, difference be? That is because you are solving a tridiagonal matrix equation and it does depend on uh, the operation accumulates those errors, round off error. Right? If I go from j equal to 1 to n, then I have a one sequence of error accumulation and if I go from j equal to n to 1, I have a different uh, features. So, there are some minute uh, differences, but which is not seen in these two frames. Uh, in a sense, it is good that at least for a problem of this kind, you do not need to worry tremendously about the direction of uh, radial filter, but for some uh, combination of physical parameters, this might affect the solution also. So, uh, basically this is a kind of a uh, portrait which will tell you how you are doing as compared to what people may have uh, uh, noticed in an experiment. This is an experiment done in uh, uh, France uh, published in JFM in 2006. Uh, nice experimental visualization pictures. This is the cylinder performing rotary oscillation and you see nice uh, vertical structures. These are not like your Karman vortex streets. So, that is what you can see very clearly. The vertical structures are interleaved. They are all connected together. That is exactly uh, what you actually get if you uh, solve it with a uh, lot of care and care is uh, done in this way, uh, taken this way. This is a quite a fine grid calculation in the middle column. So, you do not have any uh, worry of filtering to do. So, that uh, gives you a very good match with the experiments. This is the kind of uh, computation one would like to do, where your uh, computation and experiments, they actually uh, look uh, rather very close to each other. Now, on the last uh, column, we are showing some filtered solution. Uh, obtained with a six order filter and uh, this is uh, uh, interesting because we have applied the filter on the first 30 lines uh, close to the surface of the cylinder with a value of alpha 0.49 whereas the radial filter has been applied in the complete domain so uh, it yes No, there, there is not, there is not. That is the whole intention is to show that uh, if you choose the parameters, choose the directions okay, and choose the way you want to do, then you should not be seeing much of a difference. In this case, there are actually no differences at all. Okay. So, this solution that we have shown in the middle is to convince you, I mean if you do not apply a filter, what sort of solution you should get. This is a stable case. This does not lead to instability. Whereas, uh, if I do something uh, what I shown you earlier, if I would have used a second order filter, I have used the azimuthal filter all over the domain, then things would have gone pretty bad. But if you do a high order filter and even if you apply azimuthal filter, you apply it very close to the surface only. Okay. And then uh, that does not cause any problem and of course, uh, the radial filter is applied over the whole domain and with a filter uh, value that is quite drastic 0.45 is uh, quite a strong filtering, but even then you can see th there is no difference at all between uh, these two uh, sets of uh, results. <coughs> so, basically um, my intention is to uh, 
sort of convince you that uh, use a filter correctly and uh, it would work to your advantage and you would, it would not uh, lead to unphysical results. It is not somehow to get so called stable solution should be our goal. We need uh, uh, accuracy and that is uh, rather important. Okay. Now, this is something uh, which we uh, done in uh, very, very recent times. Uh, <coughs> this is the only work that has been reported so far. Uh, what we do is uh, what we had done earlier for uh, central schemes when we are developing compact schemes, we realize that sometimes numerical instabilities can be cured by upwinding. Huh? So, here we try to develop an upwind filter, uh, Yogesh did and uh, you actually add an additional uh, fourth order dissipation term uh, with a floating uh, constant eta that should be uh, what we will call as the upwind coefficient and that should give you some additional degree of freedom. And why we are doing it I will explain to you. This is important because this is not just simply a uh, another filter that you have. Now, what you are seeing is the transfer function of uh, this upwind filter at different nodes and uh, <coughs> for different values of the upwind coefficient. The this, this is each equal to 0 0.001, both of them are. So, uh, top you are seeing the real path, the real path will tell you that how things are. The first and the last point, uh, the variables do not change at all, they, are, they just remain same. Now, if you uh, look at uh, let us say j equal to 2 and n minus 1, you get to this uh, value, okay? uh, that is this value the lowest uh, sets of points and as you go inwards it uh, keeps uh, improving. So, filtering is restricted only to the high uh, cage and this imaginary part actually would add on to the dispersion property that is what we have talked about. If you recall what we said that uh, g hat is uh, g times t. Now, suppose uh, I have uh, this of course, we will have this right, a g of the basic numerical method will be complex. So, it has a real path uh, and the, let us say these are uh, looking at a particular node, jth node that is what we are looking at. Uh, this I should uh, multiply with uh, T j. Now, T j also has a real path and it will also have a imaginary path. Now, what happens to your g hat real would of course, uh, come from here. Uh, let me be consistent. g j r r times So, this is the real part and So, basically uh, you can see what has happened here is uh, this I could call it g j r and this I will call it as g j i. Right. Remember that with the original method that we had uh, that defined your numerical phase speed uh, through that uh, beta j. Beta j was minus tan inverse of uh, g j i by g j r. Right. So, now what will happen here, you are uh, after filtering you are going to get this, uh, it, this will change because the real and imaginary parts have changed and that would be this tan inverse uh, g hat of t j i by g hat of t j i. So, that is uh, what happens. So, you can see uh, if you have a transfer function with the imaginary path, then you are going to see that beta j and beta hat j, they are not same. Hmm. But you can very clearly see that uh, if uh, t j i is equal to identically equal to 0, then you will uh, get beta j should be equal to beta j. 
So there is no change in dispersion property because that's what eventually this uh, defines your Cn by C and Vgn by C. If you uh, look at your old notes, you will see that uh, that's what you get. Cn by C is beta j by k delta t. Remember that expression that we have. So now things do change. So what happens is um, the two ways we can uh, bring in uh, the transfer function to become complex. One is of course uh, this boundary closure. Another one here is by design. We are purposely introducing a upwind filter, which will have a imaginary path, and which will uh, show you this kind of a behavior. So you will see that uh, TJI uh, has this kind of a property, and what does it do? That's what we uh, like to see. Now the previous case uh, was for a eta equal to 0 0.001, and alpha was uh, uh, at 0.45. Here we are basically seeing uh, the effect of uh, real path for different upwind coefficients, and you can see uh, it's it's got uh, quite a bit of a control for us because if I take uh, eta equal to 0 0.01, uh, I can see the filtering uh, operation starts from a rather a moderate value of kh of one itself, whereas uh, if I uh, keep uh, reducing the value of eta, uh, the filtering uh, gets delayed to higher cage, right. So, this is what you see at 0.45, alpha equal to 0.45. If you increase uh, alpha to even higher value of 0.485, you will see that uh, this is uh, further delayed, the filtering action for lower values of eta. So, basically it gives you a, a confidence to really uh, uh, be able to have another parameter by which you can uh, perform. Now, this, these are the corresponding imaginary part and you can see the kind of thing is uh, that uh, larger values of eta actually brings in a very, very strong value of uh, uh, the imaginary part and that can change uh, the dispersion properties significantly, very, very significantly. Whereas smaller and smaller values of eta, the effects uh, would be marginal and restricted to uh, very high values of cage. So, having gotten that uh, lead, we could uh, basically uh, define the benefits of upwind filters. Uh, we have seen that uh, problems arise uh, due to numerical instability near the boundary and excessive damping. Uh, this we could uh, rectify by using upwind filter and we also can allow a controlled amount of dissipation in the interior and the absolute control of this. Uh, allows one to really perform uh, what is called as a subgrid scale model used for large eddy simulation, a very specialized branch of computing which has been uh, in use for many decades, but uh, with uh, this kind of analysis now we are uh, seeing a better explanation of the same. Okay? So, um, basically this subgrid scale models are uh, related to uh, that part of the flow which you are not resolving because of your grid size. So, to be not able to resolve that uh, scale uh, is equivalent to adding some, adi uh, having some extra stress and this is uh, what is uh, attempted in this uh, subgrid scale stress models. It is a, a, a fertile area of research, but uh, let us not uh, worry too much about it, but let us uh, see what uh, we can do uh, if we look at uh, a central filter versus an upwind filter on the right. Okay. Now, you are seeing basically the numerical amplification contours and as you can uh, uh, see that uh, there is not uh, much of a difference uh, between the two, not much of a difference between the two. Uh, only thing is with the upwind filter, let us say this 0.999 uh, value has come slightly below 1. Okay. Earlier it was above 1. So, there is a marginal uh, difference that you see. Uh, however, what was intended in doing uh, this exercise was uh, is uh, given in this figure. If we used a central filter, then we uh, identified a region of Q waves here shown by this uh, shaded area. <coughs> so, this is your Vgn by C equal to 0 line. Now, what you do? is uh, you keep the same filter coefficient 0.45, but uh, use a upwinding uh, of the filter. So, eta becomes 
0.001 and then what happens? Then you see what happens is that this zero line actually turns back and then you have a region of N C as shown by this uh, green shaded area on the right uh, for which there is not going to be any Q waves at all. Okay? So, this is uh, something that was intended, that was the whole motivation uh, behind uh, designing this upwind filter and it just does show that uh, you have a very narrow window, but you do have where you will not uh, suffer from that extreme dispersion effect of Q waves. So, this is uh, one thing that was achieved and this we have seen before. This is uh, another example, uh, a tougher case, you know an aerofoil section which looks like this uh, is uh, exposed to a flow coming from left to right. So, this is uh, like a normal flat plate type of geometry and you do get uh, very, very significant uh, uh, vertical structure uh, originating from the ends of this aerofoil and uh, there are some comparison of results, you know, very high order filters have been used, 6th and 8th order filter uh, in the azimuthal direction with alpha equal to 0.48. And these are the corresponding experimental visualization. It is very uh, difficult to visualize this type of flows. So, the aerofoil is uh, somewhere there and this is the vortex that is shed from top and this is uh, another vortex that is shed from bottom. So, there is some kind of asymmetry of the shed vortices because of the asymmetry of the geometry itself. The top uh, side is uh, rounded whereas, the bottom side has got a very sharp edge. And the sharp edge actually brings about a much more diffuse larger vortex, whereas the top surface uh, has additional uh, secondary separation occurring from uh, on the surface itself, where this is uh, very well defined. In fact, uh, if you have those of you who do not uh, belong to aerospace engineering, you may have wondered why the wing shape is like this. It is for this, that if you have a sharp uh, trailing edge you can actually uh, force the flow to uh, change locally there. Whereas, if you have a rounded uh, edge, then the effects are diffused and it can actually cause lot of unsteadiness. Whereas, this kind of uh, sharp change in the trailing edge actually helps in uh, a better performance of the wing and that is why this is shaped like this, you know. Uh, this is very uh, wrongly understood that uh, aircraft flight is more like a swimming of a fish than flying of a bird, because uh, the physics is uh, totally different. Uh, when uh, a bird flies, it actually flaps its wing, so it is a basically unsteady motion, whereas a fish glides through in the water. And if you look at a cross section of a fish, that would look more like this than, uh, than if you take a section of a bird's wing, that would look like this. Anyway. Uh, the whole idea is this is again a very uh, uh, tough problem to solve and which one could solve here uh, uh, by, uh, by uh, filtering uh, with uh, both uh, we have done it with uh, uh, azimuthal <coughs> filters uh, as well as the upwind filters in wall normal direction. And some of these results are shown here for different time, but uh, let me just uh, simply close this uh, discussion by looking at uh, what we should be uh, doing. We must uh, develop a strategy that uh, we have to find out a optimum filter. So, that optimal filter uh, should be a combination of azimuthal uh, filter that is uh, applied close to the wall uh, and whereas, in the wall normal direction, you would have a non periodic filter. See, azimuthal direction is a special direction because you have a perfect periodicity of the problem, right? So, you do not need to worry about uh, this so called boundary closure. So, what happens is many a times uh, people are very much attracted to use filter in the azimuthal direction because it is easier, you do not have to do additional problems, uh, and then it uh, uh, is. Uh, also uh, has the property of retaining its property uniformly across all nodes 
Uh, however, we have seen azimuthal filters uh, has this tendency to change the physical nature of the flow. So, what you should do is basically apply azimuthal filter, uh, which can be a central filter, but apply it only close to the wall. Whereas, uh, the radial direction you can, you have to use a non-periodic filter and a upwinded filter is uh, uh, found to be the best. <coughs> Uh, I do not wish to go through this uh, second point, it is something to do with computing fluid mechanics. So, let us not worry about it. Uh, third point also as I told you, uh, it actually circumvents sometimes to do those fancy turbulence or subject scale modeling. So, this is uh, a very, very good tool for one to learn and use it uh, imaginatively and uh, you could uh, <coughs> also uh, note that uh, whenever you use non-periodic filter, you still have the problem of numerical instability near inflow and excessive damping near outflow. This has to be investigated, analyzed and sorted out up front. So, that can be worked out by using upwind composite filter, which actually even allows you to add control dissipation in the interior. Uh, upwind filters has better dispersion property, we showed that it can circumvent Q wave formation and this approach of using upwind filter uh, does not require using different equations in different parts of the flow. This is one of the problem with large eddy simulation or direct eddy simulation people use. Okay, so, I think uh, we will uh, uh, stop here on this and I would like to go into the new topic which is uh, going to be on uh, finite element method. So, uh, basically it is uh, our way of uh, looking at uh, this very uh, special branch of computing. A finite element method is uh, all pervasive, people uh, like to know more about finite element method, but we have uh, uh, kept our focus intact on the scientific computing aspect of it which is often uh, not very well understood by uh, many. <coughs> uh, let us uh, start by discussing about the various uh, things that we know of that we have uh, focused most of our attention in whole of this course on finite difference method. One of the problem that we have noted is uh, it cannot, well we have not noted because we have not talked about geometry aspect we did not do anything about grid generation etcetera, etcetera. That is a se separate uh, uh, sub branch of uh, computing, but uh, finite difference are essentially uh, more difficult to use on complex geometries. <coughs> However, <coughs> they have uh, uh, excellent uh, resolution properties uh, and we have seen that uh, finite difference methods when well designed can produce uh, results which are extremely accurate, which are otherwise not possible by other uh, uh, method. Uh, for example, uh, uh, we have uh, finite element and finite volume method, which are extremely attractive uh, in handling complex geometries uh, and therefore, boundary conditions becomes easier to apply. Uh, specifically, in finite element method, uh, what uh, you do is uh, you break down the computational domain into smaller subdomains and on each of these subdomains you approximate the governing equation by either uh, variational methods uh, or by some what is called as a weighted residual methods. Okay? Uh, calculus of variation is a very uh, classic field. Uh, it uh, started off with Euler and lots of people have uh, contributed. Uh, unfortunately, when it comes to <coughs> uh, some special branches of uh, computing like in fluid mechanics, uh, we do not pay much attention to variational methods, because the variational principle does not exist when you are looking at uh, dissipative flows. For example, uh, the governing Navier-Stokes equation does not allow you to develop a variational method. Whereas, uh, the complementary uh, aspect of it is uh, uh, via this weighted residual method, that could be uh, quite uh, easily done and we will uh, spend 
time talking about the next uh, four days that we have at our disposal. Now, what you are trying to do is uh, in uh, F A M, uh, you take this smaller subdomains and in the smaller subdomains, you try to fit the solution locally by simpler polynomials. That is the essential idea. So, what you have? You have a big problem, you break it into smaller pieces and then on each of the small pieces, you locally fit uh, solutions by polynomials and try to find out those coefficients in this polynomial that is essentially is done. So, basically in F A M, uh, it would appear that overall solution is approximated by a local representation, uh, which is uh, different from uh, global method. So, basically uh, let us say if I have say some unknown uh, u of x, I could uh, write it by let us say Fourier series and I could uh, write it as uh, u hat of k and I could write u of some let us say k j right and here of course, uh, j could go from 1 to infinity in the actual case. This is what you know uh, what you do in a Fourier spectral method. So, this is what is called as the Fourier spectral method. So, what you keep doing is uh, of course, uh, you cannot uh, accept a infinite series. So, you will uh, stop at some finite number of terms and your intention would be uh, in a problem to be able to find this uh, Fourier coefficients. Okay. <clears throat> what you notice in this uh, global method, so this is a kind of a, a global method. Why do we call it a global method? I will explain. Uh, a global method is one where uh, if you make some kind of a change, then that effect is felt globally in the whole domain. So, for example, if I change it from n to n plus 1, I have just uh, added uh, one more term in the Fourier re representation. Uh, you would be surprised to see that uh, this quantity uh, will change across the whole scale. That is that's your global method. right? That is what we are saying that uh, let us say if we use a spectral method, uh, this is a global method. But we have already seen, we are now more or less convinced that if we take a Fourier spectral method, uh, what do we find for C n by C is equal to 1, V g n by C equal to 1. So, spectral methods are very, very attractive. Uh, however, uh, uh, they have some restrictions. What is the main restriction? The main restriction is as we have written here, the problem has to be periodic. right? If we are summing by Fourier series, it has to be a periodic problem. So, it so happens that uh, many physical problems, uh, this uh, imposition of periodicity uh, lends itself uh, to some sort of a uh, unphysical attribute to the problem. So, not all problems can be evolved. Most of the problems cannot be uh, rep replaced by a uh, periodic uh, extension of the same problem. Okay. So, that is one thing. The second thing is of course, in uh, Fourier method, you end up uh, working uh, in the physical domain itself. Okay. Suppose, I am looking uh, at the problem in the Cartesian uh, frame, then I stay there and I am also forced to use equal spacing and that is a major, major uh, uh, constraint. Whereas, um, in contrast, uh, what you can do in uh, most of the other computing methods, we have seen all of them suffer from uh, various sources of error. That is what we have spent the whole course almost talking about various sources of error and all these other discrete methods suffer from those problems. Okay. And what happens is, of course, despite that we live with them is simply for the reason that 
we can actually handle problems which are not restricted by the constraint of this special type of global method. We can talk about non-periodic problems, we can talk about non-uniform spacing, where we need more accuracy, we can cluster more number of points, where we do not, we cannot. So, uh, this is uh, something that we uh, really uh, need to uh, appreciate and that is one of the reason that finite element and finite volume method enjoys its uh, reputation of what it is. Uh, Let us uh, briefly discuss about what this weighted residual methods are. So, that uh, let us talk about a problem as evolution equation is written like this. This L of u could be any problem that you talk about. Let us say you have a space time dependent problem, you perform all the spatial discretization. At the end of the spatial discretization, you will have a time varying equation of this kind. <coughs> okay. And let us say this uh, uh, talk about a one dimensional problem for simplicity. Uh, x uh, belongs in a domain uh, omega and for all uh, the problem starts at t equal to 0. So, you are interested in finding out uh, the solution evolution and the initial condition is given by u 0 uh, defined everywhere and in addition you would have the boundary conditions like what you did in your second assignment. You have uh, time dependent boundary condition uh, at the boundary defined as uh, delta omega. Now, uh, what you need to do in uh, developing a weighted residual method is to start with uh, defining a trial function. So, the numerical solution we indicate by subscript capital N, basically that uh, defines how many terms we are taking. We are showing it this trial solution to be composed of two parts. Uh, one is uh, here C J T. Uh, times u j x and there is this additional term u b of x t. What this u b of x t is, that is a special function that is used there to specifically satisfy the boundary condition. You see, we are not going to do periodic condition, this will be non-periodic condition. So, that uh, boundary condition would be given to you uh, as has been given in 3 like f of b uh, as a function of time. So, this uh, second part of the trial solution actually helps you in satisfying the boundary condition. Okay. <clears throat> Whereas, at the boundary, this u j s are 0. So, that this exactly satisfies the boundary condition. right? Now, <clears throat> this base, this functions are called the basis function in this series, huh? that uh, summation uh, term, which has a, let us say, time dependent uh, coefficient c j of t times a space dependent function. Now, <clears throat> This u j s are the basis function and they are uh, um, such that uh, you can satisfy the prescribed boundary condition, but that would not satisfy the initial conditions and the governing differential equation. So, that means what? You will have to use equation 4 into the governing equation and try to see uh, if you can derive some uh, relations among all these CJs. I think we will uh, continue uh, with this in the next class. This needs a little bit of uh, understanding how these things work.